All right, you guys ready? Wow, that was, let's try that again. Are you guys ready? Woo, oh, I'm scared there for a minute. Hey, now before we go any further, please help me welcome Peru and everybody online. Put your hands together for them, praise God. Yeah. All right, now I'm gonna pray. Now some of you in Peru, you may be wondering, where did I get this shirt? You can thank Miss Leslie up there in Peru for doing this, all right? She, she's the one who got this for me, and they didn't think I'd wear it. All right? So here we go. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for each and every person under the sound of my voice. I pray that you bless them, touch them, minister life to them. Have your way. Have your way in each and every heart, God. Change us for eternity, me included, God. Continue to grow us. Father, we love you. We honor you. We, we want you we invite you, like last weekend, we invite you into everything we do, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody says, amen, amen. amen. Well, this weekend, obviously going to celebrate VBS, going to celebrate kids, but I, uh, you know, every, every year whenever VBS rolls around, we do something a little bit different. Uh, I actually, technically, I wanted my daughter to be up here with me this weekend, and uh, I wanted to do the message with her. I think it would be super cool, uh, and, and it's super insightful as to her world, growing up in church, uh, living for God, and all that stuff, but, but I say all that to say she's over the kids' ministry in Peru, and since they're handing out Bibles up there, she didn't want to miss because she wanted to be with those kids instead of her dad. But that's all right, I'm not offended. We'll do it some other time and it'll be great. But, but in light of that, I wanna tell you what we're gonna do here today. Here's the truth. Most people will see it and, and I, can even, I can even bet that there were some people watching online last night that st stayed home because they said, well, Pastor Charlie's just preaching about kids. You know, it's just about kids and VBS and kids and you know, I don't, I don't really need to hear a message about that. I wanna know how to get my bills paid. I don't know how to, how to meet my needs. Well, here's the truth. What we're doing here today for the next couple hours, if you're a visitor, I'm kidding. Can I tell you, this makes the devil more mad than anything we probably do. It makes him mad. He, doesn't, he does not like this. Listen, it's one thing for you to be ministered to. It's another for those kids to get focused and for them to be encouraged because we are affecting generations by loving on those kids and increasing their faith. Praise God. Amen? So, so by no means do I look at this lightly or take it lightly. To me, it is a big responsibility when it comes to ministering into the kid's life. So in light of that, I want to kind of give you just a little bit of taste here, and then I'm going give, to give you some good, good uh, stuff before we leave. But, but here's what, the first thing I want you to understand. I believe right now, more than any other time, that, uh, that in human history, that kids are the target of the enemy. Come on, somebody. Kids are the target. Kids are the target. I mean, come on. The enemy has learned how to use all the technology and everything he can to focus on those kids. And I'm here to tell you, he is doing a very, very good job. And if you're not careful, you're going to miss it with your kids. Now, in light of that, let me just say this. His plan is to get to their hearts first before you do. His goal is always to program their little hearts long before you ever get to their hearts. And I will tell you, he does this through education. Not that I'm against school. We're going to pray for teachers and schools here in just a minute. I'm not against any of that. But I will tell you that if you're not careful and you stick your head in the sand with your kids, you're going to end up losing your kids to the, to the enemy. And you know what? It's not going to go well for you. You're going to pray the rest of your life to try and get them back. I would say that you probably should do the work on the front end, keeping your kids a part of the things of God and loving God so that they can grow in their faith and be all that God has called them to be. Can I get a big amen on that? I, I, uh, I did a series, I believe it was last year in, in March. You can go back. It's called Get There First. And I talked about how the next generation, young kids, we got to get there first. What has happened is, you know, matter of fact, just this week I was talking to a young kid and they were talking about how they're annoyed at the school that they go to because here's the deal. You ready? They spent three weeks talking about Darwinism and everything that goes with that theory. It is a theory, okay? That theory. And they spent one class period talking about creation. 
What's going on? And again, I don't blame teachers for that. I know the curriculum is, well, anyway, here, here's the truth. You ready? The truth of the matter is, if you get there first, it doesn't matter what they say. You got to get there first, praise God. You got to get to the heart of ki your kids first. Now, get this, you ready? The enemy is targeting them younger, faster than any other generation before. I mean, think about it. I don't know about you, but when I was 12 years old, I was not thinking about some of the things they're thinking about. Come on, at 12 years old, girls were still goofy, silly. Come on. Some of you are like, they still are. Stop. I am of the opinion if you put, I don't care how old, three men in one room, they go all the way back to middle school. Come on, where you at? And the ladies raised their hand. I seen them. Because it's true, it's true, it really is. But here's the truth, you ready? The enemy is targeting kids, and if the church isn't smart, we lose in that battle. Listen to this, you ready? We must race to the heart of the next generation. And again, last February, I preached a whole series on this. But listen to this, we must get there first. Younger, faster, better. And that's what this weekend is really all about. Getting to the heart of these kids. Younger, faster, better. It is cool for them to come to a place, in my opinion, come to a place that has the things that they desire, the things that they want. We have to allow the house of God to be a place where they desire to come, want to come, they want to be a part of. And if that's the case, listen, it can't be 100 years behind the times. It has to be relevant. It has to speak their language. It has to be, it has to be palatable at best, if not a very attractive for those kids to want to be a part of the things of God. So we want to create that in each and every one of them. Now, here's what I want to ask you. Believe it or not, there are people that study this like that's their job. They study how to keep kids a part of the house of God and how to keep kids growing in their faith and how to keep kids whenever they move from teenage years into, uh, into a young adulthood, how do they keep them plugged in the church? And I'll tell you the place, the place that I go to for resources and the place that as a staff we go to, and it's called the Fuller Institute. Now, before I go there, I just want to say this. Is there a civil, civil, silver, praise God, it's a big word, apparently. <sighs> Is there a silver bullet? Is there a weapon we can use? Is there something that allows kids to grow in their faith and be a part of the house of God? Believe it or not, you're going to be shocked at what they, what they have found in the past. And whenever I begin to explain it, you're going to think about your own childhood, some of you. And be like, yep, that makes total sense. But there is a silver bullet. There is one way that kids want to be a part of the house of God. And you say, well, does that mean having the greatest, you know, light bright wall down in kids' ministry and they'll want to be? No. Having the greatest things in their rooms? No. Is it having fun worship down in their, their kids' ministry? No. Believe it or not, it's when adults in a church congregation show interest and value in them. They found that that is the key. That is the key. Now, this is where I wanted my daughter. I wanted my daughter on this one. Because if you were to ask, and I did, I said, Whitney, growing up in church, what is, the, like, what is the one thing that made you every weekend want to go back? And here's what she said. I wanted to see certain people. And those certain people, they were here yesterday, all right, at the Saturday night service. But here's what she said. I wanted to see that couple. That couple is in their 70s, late 70s now, okay? Back then they were in their early 70s. <laughs> Leave that alone. I mean, you know, I ain't that stupid. <laughs> but, but here's what they found. They found, the Fuller Institute found, that there's a magic number and there's a magic thing that happens when multi-generational church happens. It, let me explain. There's oftentimes, and I've been a part, I've actually been to pastor's conferences and every place else, where they stir up this idea of, we want to reach the next generation, okay? That's what they'll say. 
So what, what, that, what that translates into is we don't give a rip about the generation that's here right now. Let's just only reach that young generation. Okay? Now, again, I'm not against reaching the next generation. But here's what you'll find. God is a multi-generational God. The church, the house of God, should be made up of seasoned people. Come on, where y'all at? They came last night because they can't drive. <laughs> but, no, I'm just kidding. Here we go. So, so multi-generational. The, mo- the most healthy church is a representation of the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, there's multi-generations within the church. All right? Let me give it to you this way. Fuller uh, Youth Institute, if you want more information about it, I'm sure you're just itching to go study it all out. You can check their stuff out. They got a website. It's great. Here's here's what they said. I'm going to quote some of their quotes, okay? And I'm going to connect two things. Here's what I want you to see in this, all right? Well, first of all, if you walk away today knowing that we love these kids around here, in my world, I did my job. That, that, that's what I want you to know. As a church family, we love the next generation. We love these kids. If I do that today, in my world, I did my job here online in Peru. Now, in light of that, here's what I want you to understand about it. That there's some magic numbers that need to take place. There's five. Everybody say five. five. And then there's one. Everybody say one. one. Okay, so So remember that as I show you this information, okay? So let's look at it. You ready? The closest, this is there right off their website. The closest our research has come to that definitive silver bullet is this sticky finding. Here's what they found. High school and college students who experience, watch this, more intergenerational worship tend to have higher faith maturity intergenerational. What does that mean? That means when your daughter is 15 years old and she can't wait to get to church, not because she likes mom and dad, but but she loves talking to the 65-year-old, 75, the older lady (laughs) in the church that sits out at the cafe with her and takes just a little bit of time to hear her story and root her on and hear what she has going on in her life. Because mom and dad, she don't really care, but she cares about the lady who just took time and loved on her. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? You, You hear what I'm saying? See, you think you don't play a role, but you do. You play a major role. When's the last time you've seen a teenager sitting all by themselves and just went over and plopped yourself down? Now, I do it all the time, but I think they're annoyed by me. Uh, (laughs) They're afraid I'm going to say something in the message about them. All right? Although, I will tell you, i got to mention this young lady. We were up at VBS in Peru this week. We came here Monday, and then we were up there with the grandkids and and up there watching that. And I tell you, we went to B&K after... After one of the VBS nights, this young lady comes over to her car, car and she goes, I know you. You're Pastor Charlie. I go, yeah. She goes, I go to church. Her name is Riley. She works at B&K up there. And she goes, and guess what? And Riley, I hope you're in service this weekend. Listen to this. She goes, I started coming. I started bringing my mom, my dad, and all my family. Man, that's awesome, isn't it? That's awesome. That's great. And and listen, I encouraged her in it. I said, hey, you keep praying for them, keep believing, keep coming to church, you'll get them all there. But listen to this, high school and college students who experience more intergenerational worship tend to have higher faith maturity. Listen to this, the Fuller Institute, they discuss in depth on their website and they have plenty of resources there. But here's the next thing I want you to understand. You ready? Watch this. Five adults, everybody say five. Five, what they found is five adults within the house of God investing in them in some way makes them feel like the church cares about them. See, we think it's we got to have worship, we got to have drummers, we got to have worship, we got to have this, got to have that, got to have this. When it all boils down to it, here's the truth it's all relationship driven. Kids want to know that you care about them relationally, 
All right, listen to this. Five adults that know their story, understand their hearts, act as cheerleaders, and can be confidants. Kids who have that are more likely to feel a sense of belonging and adhere to the positive values of their parents that they want to instill. Isn't that awesome? Five, five. Every kid that comes into ALC, five adults need to grab a hold of those kids and just love on them. You don't even... I didn't even ask you to serve in kids' ministry. <laughs> Some of you don't need to serve. In kids. You don't even like kids. Right. You, know, you struggle with your kids. All right. But listen, you can have a conversation with a young kid and love on them. Listen to this next part. Watch this. This is very important. Turns out the research suggests kids that have adults investing in them are more likely to keep their faith late into adolescence in their, in their early adulthood. That's a powerful statement. Check this out, you ready? As a research team, we weren't all surprised by that. Of five major sources of support, watch this. Adults in the congregation, there's one area of support. Parents, youth workers, friends in youth group, friends outside of youth group. Now watch this, here's the sad part. High school seniors ranked adults in the congregation last. So, so let me translate. What, what they're saying is, out of everybody that's supporting them, parents, you know, youth workers, all this, just the average adult in the congregation is the last person to encourage them. Can I tell you with all my heart, that should not be so. We should be cheering these kids on. We should be rooting for them. We should be a voice into their world. Come on, somebody. We should be cheering them on, praise God. They're tomorrow's church leaders, and we got to do it. We got to do it, all right? So let me give you a couple things. They found out four things, and I'm going to give them real quick to you, all right? And then I'm going to give you eight. That's like 11 and a half points. Bon Air math. All right, so here it is. You ready? Four things about it. Four things about it that they found. These are from their studies. Here they are. They said, involvement in all church worship service during high school is more consistently linked with mature faith in both high school and college than any other form of church participation. So the most valuable thing is you bringing them and letting them worship together with you. Praise God. You all getting that? That is important. I know I know, especially in those teenage years. We've all been there. Well, if you haven't, let me explain how it's going to go. I don't want to go. <laughs> but according to what they're saying is, even though the kid on the outside says they don't want to go, it's the most valuable thing they can be doing to grow in their faith and stay plugged in the church. All right? And I can tell you, as a, little, as a 15-year-old, 14-year-old rebellious somebody, I did not want to go. It was a Friday night, and you know what's up. If you're 15 and it's Friday night and you live up by the skating rink, you know where you belong. <laughs> you belong at the skating rink. And my parents drug me over to the Isaacs. Come on, that, that picking and a grinning. All right, the Isaacs were playing, all right, over there by a, a church in Muncie, and we drove by there recently, and they tore down the building since then. But, but that building, I went over there, I was a rebellious teenager, and you know what? We sat in that worship service, and I remember with everything in me, I was like, mm, mm, mm. y'all know, come on, y'all know what I'm saying, right? And while I'm sitting there doing this, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, God is in this place. And I remember that. Matter of fact, if you were to ask me where was the first place I ever felt God, not, not, not heard about God, first place I felt God's presence in my life was right there in that little bitty church, the Isaacs, picking in a grin, and not even music, it was not Led Zeppelin. <laughs> All right? It was the Isaacs, you know, that good old-fashioned country songs. Y'all know what I'm saying? And I'm telling you, from that point on, I said a lot of things, but I said, you know what? I can never deny that there is a God because I felt him in that place. So even though the kids on the outside may be doing one thing, know this, on the inside, God's doing something bigger. Amen? But listen to this. Involvement in worship. Check this out. Second point here the, of, of the insight that they received is the more students serve and build relationship with younger children, the more likely they are to stick to their faith. 
older kids serving the younger. I was so proud of our youth group. Uh, uh, they, they took in the youth served in VBS this weekend, or this week. Absolutely awesome, all right? Absolutely awesome. When you have the older kids serving the younger kids, there's something about that investment that God, when they pour out, God pours in. And I just believe with all my heart that one of the best things you could do for your teenagers is get them involved in serving somehow. Because whenever they get involved in serving, I'm telling you right now, they're pouring out, God's pouring in, they're connecting themselves typically to adult leaders, and those adult leaders can speak into their lives. Matter of fact, one of the young men out there in the parking lot this weekend is a teenager. Don't hit him. He's a big kid, too, so don't hit him. But, but my point is this. I love walking around God's house and seeing young people serving. Yeah. And it's not that, watch this, it's not that we need to fill a hole. It's the fact that I believe by them serving, they're getting plugged into adult relationships that can encourage them in their faith. Amen? I believe that. So, so know where I stand on it, all right? Here's the next one, you ready? High school seniors don't feel supported by adults in the congregation. We already talked about that. I feel like I hit that pretty good. All right, listen to this, you ready? Listen to this, this is important because this kind of goes into your world. By far, the number one way that churches made the teens, young people uh, in the survey feel w uh, welcomed and valued was, watch this, when adults in the congregation showed interest in them. Just showing interest in them, loving on them, letting them know you're glad they're at church. You know what I mean? Giving them a hard time, that's what I do. I give them a hard time, all right? Make fun of their shoes, they love that. I'm just kidding, all right? But I promise you with all my heart, it's about taking just a little bit of time and investing in them. And believe it or not, it'll make all the world of difference. Now. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of jump, but I kind of want to connect it to something because some of you are like, okay, Pastor Charlie, I get it. We need to invest in young people. Young people need to hear our voice into their life, and that is the key to them growing in their faith. Yes, it is. Now, how do we do that? Well, let me explain something, and I've taught this before, this, this principle I'm about to show you, and then I'm going to give you eight things to go along with it. So here it is. You ready? Here's the thing I want you to understand. Here's what we're after, okay? And, and when it's done well, you'll see the results. So watch this, everybody. This is actually from parenting, okay? But listen, here's the truth. Truthfully, whenever it comes to us sowing into the next generation, even though this is parenting, it applies to how the house of God and how the church operates. So here it is. You ready? You have parents' values. We could easily say congregation values. We could see, easily say faith values, whatever you want to put there, all right? But values and beliefs. Now watch this, everybody. On the other hand, you have a child's lifestyle and their values and what they believe in, their beliefs and their values. How do you get your values and beliefs into a child, into a kid? All right? Well, Pastor Charlie, you beat them down and you preach it to them and you tell them they got to believe it or they're going to go to hell and go to bed. <laughs> okay, here's the truth. You ready? That's not going to work. That's not going to work. All right? Listen to this. You have to build a relationship bridge into their world. And I will tell you, this is true in life and it's true with young people and it's true with old people. Here's the truth. You can never... Watch, you can never put more on the bridge than the relationship can hold. Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? You can't beat them. If you've not built a strong relationship with them, you can't speak and destroy them because it will destroy them. You can't speak heavy into them because it will destroy them. So think about it, if you just barely know somebody you shouldn't go correcting them, telling them everything that they need to be doing and this and that and the other. How I many of you know, nobody likes people like that. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We all know people that think they can speak into your world and they, it's like, what, brother? I don't even know you. You are not qualified. <laughs> okay, now let's flip it around. You have someone that's spoken into your world, you've loved on, they've loved you, this and that and the other, over a years, over years. How many of you know they can say pretty much anything they want and you'll take it into your heart and be like, okay. 
Why? Because the relationship bridge there is so strong, you can put anything on the bridge and it holds up. Y'all getting what I'm saying? And so what we want to do is we want to build a relationship with young people so that the bridge is built so that we can infuse our beliefs and our, and our values into their world so that they understand what God wants from them. Can I get a big amen on that? And it's just a real simple principle. And I will tell you, parents, you need to be doing this. You, this right here. This right here is where it's at. Find ways. There are things that I did for my kids that I in no way, shape, or form was interested in. No, I was not interested in it. But I did it because they were into it. If they were into it, I became a fan of it. Why, because I valued the relationship. Do you know I got into hunting not because I wanted to hunt? I got into hunting because my son went to Eastern where all the kids hunt, and my son wanted to hunt, so guess what I learned? How to fall out of a tree. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but, but, but the truth of the matter is, it's all about learning their world and understanding their world. Can I get a big amen? Amen. All right, y'all get it. Okay, so I'm going to give you eight things real quick here on how it works. You ready? How do you build this relationship bridge and how do you strengthen it? This will work in your marriage. It will work in any relationship. But most importantly, where I'm targeting is in these kids' world. So let's talk about number one, you ready? Unconditional love, everybody say it, come on. Unconditional love. Okay, what is unconditional love? Well, I'm gonna give you just a brief definition, here it is. Unconditional love means choosing to love regardless of circumstances. Do you believe that? I'm gonna love you regardless of circumstances. Now here's the deal. A lot of what people say is unconditional love truthfully is not unconditional love, all right? If you want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it tells you what love is all about. It says love, is, lo, love does not parade itself. Love does not puffed up. It does not seek its own. It does not behave rudely. All right? We could just list all the things that love is. But here's the truth. You ready? This love, this love is so important for a child to feel. Listen to this. You ready? Unconditional love depends on the giver's commitment to it, not the qualifications or response of the recipient. Whenever you think about God, God unconditionally loves you. Here's the truth. He wants you to respond to it, but even if you don't, he's not brokenhearted about it because he's doing his part. He's loving on you. Let, let, me, get, let me flip that around and show you in practical ways how it works. You ready? Um, I wanted to unconditionally love my kids. So every night, go up there and pray for them. Up there, because we had a second story, they were upstairs in their bedrooms. I'd go up there and let's say they got in trouble. It would, it would happen. All right? Send them up to their room because whatever. All right? Go up there. They're getting, it's bedtime. I go in there. I'm like, hey, time to go to bed. Whatever. I go, no. I go, I'm going to pray for you. You know what? Their response doesn't faze me at all. My job is to pray for them, love on them, and encourage them. All right? And discipline them, if necessary. All right? Pray for them. Good night. Love you. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> See, now watch. There are some parents, they would do it different. They'd go up there and be like, hey, I'm here to pray for you now. I know you're upset, and I offended you, and I upset you, but, you know, what can we do to make this better? Because they're, quote, trying to build a relationship bridge. No, that's called conditional love. What you've taught your kid is that your love changes based upon their behavior. And what you really want to teach your kid is no matter how you respond to me, I'm still going to love you. Come on, talk to me. You get it? It's so important that you see it that way. I'm going to love you regardless. You can act like a fool, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to love you anyway. Now, that doesn't mean you don't suffer consequences, and we're going to take care of business, but I promise you, you need to do what's right. Everybody getting what I'm saying? All right, listen to the second one. This, again, this is about building that bridge. Here it is. You ready? Scheduled time. Scheduled time. I've told Michelle this before. I, I think one, some of the funnest time in life was that whenever we, we had we knew we were we knew we were going to be with our kids. We were going to have Christmas break. We were going to have a fall break. We were going to have a summer vacation. 
Those three times, we were going to have scheduled time fun together. You know what I mean? Once the kids grew up, it got a little bit more tedious to do that. But I will tell you, nothing like scheduled time. And I'll go, I'll go one step further. Nothing like individual scheduled time with the kids. All right? Each kid. Listen to it. Let, let, I'll give you number three because it kind of pigtails off of this. Here it is. You ready? Focused attention. Focused attention. There's nothing like focusing your attention on that one kid for that moment in time. If you ever have a conversation with one of our young people, because you're going to want to now that I'm showing you the value of it, tune everything else out and listen to that person right in front of you. Listen to that kid right in front of you. Focused attention. Focused attention. And I can't even tell you, my grandkids, they'll get up on my lap and they, they have a way of doing it. They grab my face and turn it towards them. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like, yeah, they get it. They want focused attention. Matter of fact, now the debate is, Owen is two and a half, and this grandbabies, not babies, grandbabies. Now starting over, praise Jesus. But two and a half years and five years old, it's amazing because now there's a competition of who's going to stay at Mimi and Paul Paul's. Come on, y'all know what I'm saying? Because if Owen stays, two and a half year old, Emmy's like, he don't need to stay. He stayed the other day. It's my turn to stay by myself. <laughs> she wants focused attention, and, we, and we're all right with that. Here's number four. Check this out. Eye contact. I mean, you know, you need to make eye contact with those kids. Let them know. Get down on their level. Take a knee. Get down on their level. Roll around on the ground with them. Have fun with them. Here's the next one. You ready? Ongoing communication, ongoing communication. Keep the communication lines open, which means you're gonna have to practice, and I'm gonna show you what to practice right here, right now, you ready? Say these words with me, these are the greatest words you can ever learn whenever it comes to keeping the communication going. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Come on, everybody say it. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Hey listen, how many of you believe your kids think you're perfect? Here's the revelation. The only person that thinks you're perfect is you. They know you're not perfect, so it's better to own it to keep the communication lines open so you can be on the same page. Can I get a big amen on that? Amen, all right? Here's the next one. You ready? Meaningful touch. Meaningful touch. What does that look like? Well, have you ever thought about it? Dr. Dobson and Dr. Clinton all right, out of uh, uh, Focus on the Family, they did all the research on this, and here's what they found. How many physical touches do you believe a kid needs every day to be healthy? Pick a number. I heard five, 10. Watch this, you ready? 100 touches per day. That's what a, a kid needs to feel healthy. Spiritually and accepted. That's what they need. A hundred touches. You say, well, Pastor Charlie, you don't understand. I got a 10-year-old. He don't want to be touched. <laughs> oh, yes, he does. It, deep down in every kid, they want to be touched. At 10 years old, though, you don't treat him like a 10-year-old girl. I know culture says they're, they're the same. They're not the same. <laughs> if so, we'll send some kids home with you, and you tell me if they're the same. <laughs> Listen, my granddaughter... Popo, hug, hug me, cuddle with me, all right? Popo, itch my back. You know what I mean? Owen, I beat him up. I'm going to punch him 100 times every day, praise God, all right? I kid you not, though, this is true. Even with my son as he was growing up, man, even to this day, we will wreck the house fighting and wrestling, why? Because if he comes around, I'm going to touch him a hundred times, right in the mouth and the jaw and the ear. <laughs> I told him by the time he can whip me, he'll have too much respect for me. Now, we're getting close. <laughs> hey, but here's the deal. You ready? Don't tell him. Don't tell him. And if, well, I'm going to leave that alone. All right? Here's the next one. You ready? Building that relationship bridge. This is a big one, and we're about to have it. Having fun together. Come on now. We're about to have fun with our kids. You ready? The kids are coming in, all the kids, they're coming in right now. 
Because I figured it would be awesome, we figured it would be awesome to have fun with them today. Is that fair, everybody? So, hey, will you welcome them? Those in Peru, welcome you, the kids coming in right now. They're coming in. They're, they're probably not going to be quiet. They're probably going to act up and be crazy, but they're coming in, and we want to celebrate them here today, all right? So they're going to they're gonna come in, and we're going to have some fun. In Peru, you guys, in, we're in here in Kokomo, we're all going gonna, gonna to sing some songs with them and just let them know we love them, and we want to participate and worship with them, all right? Here's the last one, if you guys would look up here real quick while they make their way in. Check this out, Peru, everybody online. Pray for and pray with each other. I've told you before that I believe one of the greatest things that I did, and I didn't do it all right. Michelle and I, we did our best, but we didn't do it perfect. I prayed for my kids every morning on the way to school and every night before they went to bed. And I believe this with all my heart, that prayer, remember what I told you last week, prayer is your invitation for God's presence in your life. So I believe praying for those kids. So here's what we're going to do. They're going to make their way in here while they do that, while they do that in Peru. Listen to this, everybody. We're going to pray, and we're going to pray specifically for three things, okay? Number one, how many of you know here in just a, this week, the next couple of weeks, schools are starting back up? So we're going to pray for schools. How many of you believe that our kids are targets sitting in schools a lot of times? Amen. We're going to pray for schools. Next thing we're going to do, listen to this, everybody. We're going to pray for teachers. If you're a teacher, you work in the education system, we want to pray for you. And then last but certainly not least, we're going to pray for the kids. All right? And, uh, and Miss Whitney in Peru, Stephen, and then Miss Katie, they're going to pray for our kids at the very end again. All right? So let's pray. If you don't mind, bow your heads. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for these kids. We thank you for all that they represent. They are the next generation of church people, Lord. And we thank you that they are the most valuable resource that we've been given. And Father, we take it serious and we want to be a blessing to them. So Father, I pray for each and every kid, school, every school, under the influence of ALC, we pray for it. And Lord, I don't want to mention them by name, but we lift them up to you, Lord. And I lift them up and I pray that you would place a hedge of protection around and about each and every school. That nothing would happen within this area and region uh, without, without absolute godly protection. Father, that you would protect our kids, all the administrators, all the school leaders, that you would protect them. Lord, that you would allow the security personnel and all those people to be in place to keep our kids safe while they're in school. So we lift up the administrators and all the people making decisions as they get ready to welcome the kids back. We pray a hedge of protection around and about them, that you would give them wisdom, give them insight, give them things before things happen, God. And Father, I pray for them and I ask that you'd bless them. Now, Lord, I do lift up each and every school teacher, every administrator, every principal, every board, Lord God, that you would lead them and guide them and give them wisdom, give them insight, give them everything they need, Father, that they would not agree with the world and the world system, but they would understand godly principles and apply them in each and every school. So, Father, I thank you for blessing them and touching them. And of course, Lord, we lift up each and every kid within our, our uh, sphere of influence. We pray for them, not just the kids that are in this building, but the kids that are going to these schools, that they would be blessed there, God, that you would touch them there, God, that you would move in our school systems, that you would allow your spirit to move freely, God, and all the teaching that goes on, Father, I pray that it would teach them about you, God, and Father, we invite you into the schools, and we pray that you would have your way, God. We pray that people would be yielding to your spirit as they would lead these kids, and we thank you for it. In the mighty, precious name of Jesus, and everybody says amen. Would you give the Lord a big clap? Praise God.